Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hi there, I'm Tom Buchanan and I'll be your guide for this week's episode of MTN Outdoors. This week's stories are from all across the Treasure State, from Yellowstone to Helmville. But first, we head to Bab, where Tommy Lynch has our first story on the catastrophic failure of siphons at St. Mary Canal. Behind me, you can see where the St. Mary River's siphons have structurally failed, causing immense damage just outside of Bab, Montana. Hook's Hideaway had just been coming off of a good weekend. Yeah, we had a rodeo Saturday and we had uh, 190 contestants and there's roughly 1,700 people. That is until the St. Mary's siphons failed outside of Bab, Montana, directly affecting their business. Canceled 30 people till Friday, 30 rooms, and you know, we get, that's about six grand, you know. After getting the livestock safe, they are now working on getting an access road to Hook's Hideaway. However, that is not the only damage that will be seen. The siphon is a critical component of the Milk River Project, designed to transport water from St. Mary's River across the valley. Every year, you know, there's leaks and stuff, but they just, they don't, never seem to do nothing till now. And if you ask Powell, it's long overdue that something happens. It's like 110 years old and these are rotten and old, you know, I was surprised they lasted 110 years, you know. Technical experts will be here next week to start discussing potential short-term fixes or long-term replacements so that the siphons can get back to running as they should. In Bab, I'm Tommy Lynch, MTN News. directly onto that road, just a matter of time before some of the, those rocks hit cars. We've been very fortunate. Here's what's planned. The road will be widened from 22 feet to 30 feet. Stone guardrails will be added, as will a large parking area and a footpath protected by a rock wall. There's three prominent noses. There's a nose up on top, this one, and then the one over the viaduct. And those, those keep you from seeing the view right straight through and it, it creates a sense of anticipation of what's coming up ahead. Here at Gibbon Falls, you can clearly see the template for the Golden Gate. You have the parking area up above. You have the walking path right here and the stone wall to protect pedestrians from the traffic beyond. There are so many millions of visitors that come to Yellowstone. We want to make sure the experience is the best and starting with that is safety and security. So we'll be removing approximately 70,000 cubic yards or 98,000 tons of rock. You can't just shut it down for everybody. Uh, it's a critical route for tourists, all the people that live and work in the area. Uh, and so they're going to have to work through the blasting. They're gonna to have to work through the construction. Sholly says the blasting will mostly happen after Labor Day when the road will temporarily close. He adds the Golden Gate has a special history in Yellowstone. From 1885, it's the first stagecoach wooden bridge that took visitors on stagecoach from Mammoth South into the park. Clearly uh, Yellowstone is a, a jewel uh, for the nation. And that jewel is about to get some new facets. At Rustic Falls in Yellowstone's Golden Gate. I'm John Shearer, MTN News. Yellowstone guide Carolyn Golba. You know, I try to film as much as I can in Yellowstone because I never know what I'm going to see, you know, if I'll ever see it again. Has had some wildly visual moments in Yellowstone. I've been going into Yellowstone for over 30 years. The West Yellowstone resident says she started her guide company three years ago but is a longtime visitor to the park. It was, it was incredible. That means she knows all the good places to find amazing shots of wildlife, but nothing quite like this. I was in Lamar Valley and I got word that something was being seen in the Little America part of Yellowstone. She set up her camera and captured this. And I had people standing behind me. And as that, those cubs kept going over those logs, everybody behind me kept saying, one, two, three, 
four, five. Oh my, she's got five. <laughs> she watched the mama grizzly and her five cubs for 45 minutes. And the moment has gone down in history. That is a history moment. I mean, did you try yeah. it? So has this already been verified? We've never seen a yeah. grizzly sow? There was uh, some people there that I know that uh, called in a ranger to verify that, yeah, that he was seeing five cubs, yes. Never before has Yellowstone Park documented a mother grizzly with five cubs. And it was just the most incredible experience to see something, you know, that's a little bit of history for Yellowstone. Golba says the bear's not known and not collared, but could be the next big grizzly bear draw to Yellowstone Park, something she hopes to capture again real soon. I do go out there and I look in the same places to see if maybe, you know, maybe she does show up there, but I haven't seen her since then. But. In Billings, Andrea Lutz, MTN News. For over a decade, Madison Valley Ranchlands Group has been working to decrease conflict between wildlife and livestock. And in part, thanks to their early successes, new investments are being made to address the problem. Most years, we believe we're around 20 to 30 animals um, that the bears have taken. But we don't know for sure that it's bears or wolves or a combination. Madison Valley Ranchlands Group, or MVRG, started as seven families coming together to support ranchers in the Madison Valley. In the 90s, it was with the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park. But as grizzly bears repopulate, John Crumbly, president of MVRG, says their fight has changed. Grizzly bear problem has, has uh, changed the wolf problem. We can live with the wolves, but it's a little harder to live with the grizzly bears. As the population expands, pushing grizzly bears further north, the group says investments in conflict prevention are more important than ever. We, we have known that there's grizzlies in the tobacco roots, south tobacco roots, and the north tobacco roots, but there, there wasn't confirmed sightings. For the first time last month, an adult grizzly bear appeared on a North Meadow Creek trail cam, confirming the need for more management resources. MVRG is part of a larger landowner-led conflict reduction partnership called Heart of the Rockies Initiative. In coordination with Echo Flights, I was able to view some of the management tools from the sky. Decomposition sites help to contain attractants, and electric pads or fencing help to deter grizzlies off the land. But Burnett says the key to it all is partnership. The local action to Madison, if it can, if it can connect with the local action to Ruby and the local action to Centennial, you create the larger part of the landscape that bears need. This is what Burnett calls landscape connectivity, which allows wildlife to exist on public land while supporting landowners' efforts to prevent conflict on their land. And thanks to a $12 million combined investment, groups hope to invest in more conflict reduction, including range riding programs. For more information on these investments and wildlife conflict prevention, visit our website. In Ennis, Heaven Van, MTN News. For those who hunt in Montana, you know the process is first you go to a map and find the hunting district you want to hunt in. I'm standing in Hunt District 304. Then you apply for the species you want to hunt. Once you get your license, that's where you go. 304. Yet that highway behind me is a dividing line. On the other side of it is Hunt District 311. I can't go there with that license. However, Montana has a unique opportunity for hunters. This hunting license is special. FWP calls it super, and it turns out it's super easy for you to get a chance at it. At drawing a hunting license for most of the, of the big game species that we have in Montana um, at $5 a chance, and then if you draw that license, it allows you to hunt in any district for that species in the state. Deer, elk, moose, antelope, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, mountain lion, and bison. Select the species you'd like to hunt, pay your five bucks as many times as you'd like. Montana legislature recently gave Montana hunters a freebie as it were, just for being a Montana hunter. For residents who purchase a, a, a general deer or general elk license, 
they are automatically entered into a super tag uh, lottery for moose. All of the money raised from the super tag goes to increasing hunter access and to conservation efforts across the state. You only have a short time to apply for it though. The deadline is 1145 on Sunday, June 30th. You can go online, apply as many times as you want and pay your $5 or go into any FWP office. In the Bear Trap Canyon in Hunt District 304, Chet Lehman, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we see how to mitigate noxious weeds and learn more about a newly discovered dinosaur from Montana. But first, it's time for some trivia. There are only 10 snake species naturally found in Montana, but do you know what is the largest? Find out the answer after the break. MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. So, do you know what is the largest snake species found in Montana? With the ability to grow over seven feet in length, the bull snake is the largest of Montana's snakes. They can often be mistaken for rattlesnakes due to their coloring, and when threatened, they'll vibrate their tail against the ground, creating a rattle sound. Bull snakes are not venomous though. Montana's only snake with venom is the prairie rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes are polite enough to warn you when they're going to bite, but it's always a good idea to take some safety precautions as Alina Howder reports. It was here on Calico Avenue in the Heights where one Billings woman witnessed a rattlesnake bite the nose of a dog while it was being walked. I spoke with one snake expert on what to do if you find yourself in that situation. Sarah Wald loves to be outside. I walk regularly in the Heights. It was during one of those walks last week that she came across a boy walking his golden retriever on Calico Avenue. I was walking faster, so I kind of went out into the street to walk past him, and there was a snake in the street. That baby rattlesnake caught the eye of not only Sarah, but the little boy and his dog as well. His dog came and put his face down to the snake, and it and it bit him on the nose. It's news that doesn't surprise Humane Society Wildlife Conflict Program Manager Dave Polly. When it's hot, snakes are cold-blooded and they're very active. A reptile lover, Polly rescues snakes as a hobby. We only have 10 species of snakes and we only have one venomous, the western prairie rattlesnake. He says snakes are usually on the hunt for rodents or water, which is why you might see them in your backyard. It's not really a rodent problem, it's an attraction problem. So we go back to eliminate those attractors, that will do it. But you'll usually find rattlesnakes in places full of sagebrush and large rocks like Phipps Park. There is a pre-exposure vaccine that you can give to your dogs that would greatly um, reduce the impact to them. Keeping your dog leashed while wearing protective clothing like long pants is also a good idea. Polly carries a fishing rod holder to ward off snake attacks. This could just stop the snake from stop the snake from striking. If you or your dog do get bit, Polly says don't panic. Never increase the size of the bite wound and suck the venom. That's old, old school, not necessary and you do not have to capture the snake and bring it in. Take a picture of the snake to show to your doctor or vet, but Polly says to avoid killing the reptiles. Celebrate snakes. We should enjoy having them in our yards, having them in the wood piles. They are the coolest, freest rodent control available and really part of the Montana landscape. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. Aren't these yellow flowers just so beautiful? You'll see them on most hikes in Montana. But did you know they're actually bad for the environment because they're a noxious weed? Do you know what a noxious weed is? Uh, sounds like it's a weed that kind of takes over everything. Yeah, and if you were walking out on a trail and you saw this, would you think it was a noxious weed? No. Do you know what a noxious weed is? I absolutely, dude. If you were out on a hike and you saw this yellow flower, would you know this is a noxious weed? Gosh, I'd think it was a good looking thing, but now that you say it, Noxious weeds spread so quickly that they'll take over an area and choke out all of the good native species that we have here. Melissa Bradford has been in the weed killing business for 35 years. She started young, spraying on her family's farm at just eight years old. Now she's the co-owner of PPYC Spray and Ag and knows a thing or two about noxious weeds. They rode waterways and there's lots of examples here in Bozeman. We've got Canada thistle, hound's tongue, uh, oxide daisy, 
Corey Alyssum, St. John's Wort, Leafy Spurge. That's right, all of those beautiful wildflowers you love to see on hikes are actually terrible for the environment. They can seriously impair wildlife habitat, agriculture, and recreational opportunities. Which is why on Wednesday, you might have seen Melissa out riding her ATV, but it wasn't just for fun. We are out spot spraying noxious weeds on uh, Bozeman Health property and a few of the GVLT trails. PPYC Spray and Ag tackled the Highland Glen and Wellness Trail, the Painted Hills area, Burke Park, and the Peets Hill expansion. And if you were planning on hitting those trails, but now you're concerned about the weed killer? Products we use have no grazing restrictions, so grazing animals can be in the field with us while we spray. And we just follow the label and they're pretty safe. And some of you gardeners out there may be thinking these weeds could just be pulled by hand and we could skip the spray job altogether. But Melissa tells me, Some things can be mowed, some things can be pulled, but a lot of these plants have really deep perennial roots that are eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet deep. Leafy spurge is up to like 30 feet deep. And there's nothing you can do with those except for actually do a selective herbicide. In Bozeman, Cassidy Powers, MTN News. The Natural History Museum of Utah has announced the discovery of a new species of dinosaur and it was discovered right here in the Treasure State. It's called Loki Ceratops rangiformes. The name is inspired by the distinctive horn pattern that is similar to the Norse god Loki, as portrayed in comic books. Scientists say this dinosaur lived about 78 million years ago, and about 12 million years before its more well-known cousin, the Triceratops. The fossil remains were found in northern Montana's famous Badlands, near the Canadian border in 2019. Coming up after the break, we're heading to the Old Salt Festival and to see some pig races. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. It's generally a good idea to know where your food comes from. Derek Joseph has more on Montana producers who are helping people learn firsthand. For its second year, the Mannix Ranch in Helmville, Montana has been cleared out to make room for the Old Salt Festival, which encourages people to educate themselves on where their food comes from. Cole Mannix, the festival's founder, says this festival emphasizes the importance of buying food locally and appreciating the land it came from. We've got to get better at how we use land. We've got to recognize that we depend on it like, like it's part of our family. And that means we've got to stop treating food production, or for that matter, clothing production, as just something we take and extract from the land and we never have to replenish. One of the ways this festival pays tribute to the land around it is by cooking all of the event's food in the most natural way possible, over a wood fire. Andrew Mace, the culinary director for the Old Salt Co-op, says this was the best way to go back to the roots of cooking. Cooking meat over a fire or gathering around a fire is just so core and deep in our DNA and um, something real just pure and carnal about roasting meat over fire. Um, yeah, I think it's just really elemental, really basic uh, thing that, you know, connection, food, fire, warmth, all those things are really core. Mace also says chefs came from Montana, Oregon, and Maryland to cook on the wood grills, and the chefs who showed up all emphasized cooking local food. You know, a lot of our food supply is just anonymous. You know, we don't have a connection to where a lot of our food comes from. And so to be able to be here on the landscape where animals were raised and to be able to cook them and serve them to people, I think it just really brings it everything full circle. More information about the Old Salt Co-op can be found on our website. In Helmville, Derek Joseph, MTN News. Crowds are gathering to watch the Battle of the Little Bighorn reenactment that participants have been prepping for for days. We're just having a great time. This is a great experience. Land rich with history. You get shivers, you know, sometimes enjoying the different sights and sounds and locations where, where history happened. And riders with historical ties. I have a, a relative, Major Marcus Reno. My uh, great great uncle was uh, First Bye. Lieutenant Algernon Smith. He was in uh, charge of Company E. These are members of the U.S. Cavalry School who train anyone from beginner to expert for the battle. Okay. It's it's really nice to take somebody that knows nothing to get them to be able to ride in a reenactment like this. We teach uh, people to come out here and ride for five days of training, and uh, they graduate by uh, dying in the reenactment. A battle reenactment that wouldn't be possible without the real births, the Crow family who has put on the show for years. And this is the Indian version that we do. 
all of the spirituality of the Indian. And that's what we, we uh, portray here. Spanning for over three decades, filled with rich memories. We had a battle with the Little Bighorn in 1990, and our first Custer was a motorcycle driver that just came down the road and, and camped with us, and he's from Chicago. In Crow Agency, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Here we go, race number six. Are you guys ready? Wedged between Bell Fry and Red Lodge. We're racing pigs and having steaks at Bear Creek, Montana. It's hilarious. Referred to as a pit stop on your way to Yellowstone, Bear Creek is a town of 101 people. No offense, the people aren't why you stay. The pig races were started by the previous owners of the Bear Creek Saloon in 1990. They needed something for these tourists to do. Who doesn't want to go to Montana in the summer? Following the historic destruction of 17,000 acres. Basically, they were struggling after the Yellowstone fires. They couldn't watch the bison. They couldn't be in the park. Bear Creek's races were the first of their kind for the state. They had to work out some legal issues with the state, pass a special law, lovingly known as the pig racing bill. Animals of squalor no more here the pig is king. Some of them are just, you know, fast pigs that they know their job is to run around and get to the feed first. And other pigs, they just know that uh, they're here for a good time. They're standard uh, 4-H show pigs. Um, they, uh, they breed them specifically for us. More of a cash cow. The pigs are here for the people. Half of the money from the betting uh, board goes to the scholarship fund. Over 30 years, $155,000 has gone to Carbon County kids with 4-H and FFA who are headed to Montana colleges. They're just everyday local kids. Kids are the future, so anything about kids, especially kids that are involved in animals, makes better kids. Marcus Kakova, that'll do. Well, that's going to about wrap things up for this week's episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'll see you out on the trail.